in which Lucy is talking to Charlie Brown, and she asks Charlie Brown if he has ever known anybody who was really happy. And before she can finish her sentence, however, Snoopy comes dancing tiptoe into the frame, nose high in the air. He dances and bounces his way through two frames of the cartoon. Finally, in the last frame, Lucy changes her question. Have you ever known anybody, she says, who was really happy and was still in their right mind? <laughs> Good question. Our Declaration of Independence says we have an, absolute, an inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness because most human beings are pursuing it, which begs the question, are we really happy? And I think in our, our time frame, maybe not. We have a lot of things going against us. One is uh, a news media and politicians who are creating um, all kinds of victimhood and unhappiness and trying to get elected, so they have to make sure you think everything's bad and things aren't as good as they could be. How do you find happiness? Well, I'm starting a new series today. It's on the Sermon on the Mount, but within that series on the Sermon on the Mount, a mini-series, if you will, uh, on happiness, or maybe more accurately, blessedness. Blessed are, Jesus says. And the word there could be translated as happy, but it's more than happiness. Uh, it's uh, a deep-seated happiness, a blessedness. And Jesus wants to tell us how we get there. How do we become blessed in his view? Uh, our world is very concerned about happiness, and, uh, and even these verses have been translated as happy by some. Uh, I know Robert Schuller wrote a book called The Be Happy Attitudes, but again, I think it's more than just happiness that we're after, though we'll use the terms uh, interchangeably as we go through this series. So from the first five verses of Matthew, beginning at chapter, uh, verse 1, chapter 5, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first thing I want to talk about or say is maybe as an addendum. The first verse we're told that Jesus goes up on the mountainside. I happen to have gone to Israel for about 10 days, one of those whirlwind tours, and uh, it was a wonderful thing to do. Even though it was so short, I got to see so many things and places that I'd read about, and I can come back and say, I've seen that. Well, I've seen this place, it is a mountainside. It's not huge, but what it is, is it's so cool. It's, it, it, if it's the, the traditional place, it's up on a, a large hill that goes up from the Sea of Galilee. And so what you see is the sea or the lake from the north end going all the way down to the southern end. It's about 25 miles long. And you can see both sides and almost to the end. It's a lovely spot. So that, and literally thousands of people could have been there. And so Jesus sees the crowds. He goes up on the mountainside and he sits down. And it, it's meant to tell you that in some sense, Jesus is kind of like Moses handing down the law, giving the word of God. And that's what's going on here. Jesus is giving his word about life, and it's very practical stuff. There's only one problem with it, maybe several, is that when Jesus speaks, 
a lot of what he says is just the opposite of what we think life should be or about or what the culture thinks. And so when we talk about happiness, it's going to be very strange because he says things like uh, poor in spirit. In other words, you have to have nothing to have it all. He's going to say uh, things like, blessed are you who mourn, happy are the unhappy. Isn't that odd? And yet, there's a method to the madness. Jesus, what Jesus says, we need to remember and do and think. So Jesus' words are about everyday life, practical and yet profound. And we need to hear it. We need to hear his word, not only because they are right, but because they need to be part of the fabric of our lives as well. I think many Christians are like a man who decides to go on a walking trip. He gets out his maps and plans his destinations and he sets out to go, but after a while he decides he can't reach those destinations without some help and so he gets a bicycle. And for many people, their faith or the Bible is kind of like that bike bicycle. They've already decided what the goals they have for life are and what path they believe will lead them to happiness or their destination. For some, it's personal peace. Others, it's prosperity. Others, it's merely to get through life relatively unscathed and enjoy as much as one can along the way. Their faith and God's word are important to them and that it helps them reach their goals. But the bicycle, like their faith, says almost nothing about what their goals are, should be. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell us, and what we'll talk about through the entire Sermon on the Mount. So the first point, and I'm, what I'm going to do is, there's, like, there's 12 points, and I'm going to go through three each time. The first one is, strangely enough, you have to have nothing to have it all. Blessed are the poor in spirit, or happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, I've had a lot of people who scoff at religion or scoff at uh, going to church or scoff at having faith or at least participating. Oh, I believe in God, but I don't need to go to church because all they do in church or all the people who are religious do, all they do is navel gaze. You've heard that phrase. And sometimes in churches and or sometimes people go up on a mountain and they meditate or they think and some people call that navel gazing and what we need to be about action, we need to be about doing things. But, you know, I want to tell you something. You can learn a lot by gazing at your navel. You really can. I'm serious. You can learn a great deal. What? Well, if you gaze at your navel, you should come to at least one conclusion, and that is you are made and you didn't make yourself. We had nothing to do with coming into the world. Through the agency of our parents, but I think ultimately through the agency of God's creative process, we were born into the world. We had no say whatsoever about it. We're made and we didn't make ourselves. And by extension, we can determine, if we think about it enough, that God is God and we are not. And by another extension, you can determine that if God is God and we are not, you cannot have life, cannot find happiness, cannot find blessedness, meaning purpose, apart from God. C.S. Lewis said, you can't, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. 
And if you go even further and read what the Bible actually says about us, we find that not only are we made, but we have rebelled against all that. As Presbyterians like to say, we're debtors. We're debtors and we cannot save ourselves. To be poor in spirit is not an economic descriptor. There are some people who think it is, but it's not. It's a spiritual one. It is humility brought on by the realization that when it comes to our relationship with God, our hands are empty. Like a man who owes a creditor a huge bill he cannot pay, we come to God with a huge debt. Someone said it like this. We come to God with a huge debt of sin, an empty wallet of righteousness, and a complete inability to pay, a corrupt nature. Now this humility should not lead us to self-hatred or any sense of worthlessness but rather it is admitting the truth that our situation is desperate. It's desperate. And only then can we find peace and happiness. It's just the opposite of what you might think. The world doesn't think that. And we don't either deep down inside. But the path to happiness, in some sense, is unhappiness. The path to being blessed is to realize that we have nothing to give to God. Our hands are empty. Jesus is saying when we admit we have nothing, we find that we, we will be given everything. If we continue to think we have something, then we will have nothing. Jesus says it over and over again in different ways. He says, the first shall be last and the last first. In Jesus' scheme of things, happiness does not come with having, but in knowing you don't have. See how different that is? But it's true. The point number three is, very similar to point number two, in fact, it's the same, except that I have chosen to use a translation from the message. A man named Eugene Peterson wrote the message. It's a paraphrase of the Bible, and I really like Peterson a great deal. Now, there are things, sometimes he, when he does the message, he just misses it. Not very often. But many times, he just nails it. And I think in this case, he nailed it. He paraphrases that same verse. He says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. I remember talking to a friend of mine who is a, was a strong Christian. And he started out like everybody else. He didn't have much money and he worked hard and he became very successful. And he said, you know, Chris, as I've gotten more successful, I have found something has happened. When I was younger and I had nothing, I depended on God all the time. I prayed all the time. I needed God to help. But as I've gotten more comfortable, I don't pray as much because my needs are not as great. I remember I went reading a story uh, about a pastor who uh, had a wealthy member who was saying something similar. He said, Pastor, Pastor, when I was young and I had no money, it was really easy to tithe. I mean, I only had $100 and all I had to do was give 10 or I had $10 and all I had to do was give one. But now when I literally make thousands of dollars, it's really hard to write those big checks. And the pastor prayed for him and said, oh Lord, make my friend poor again. 
The next point is that godly tears are tears of joy. You know, the first thing we talked about, the humility of being poor in spirit is really the first step to salvation. A person will not be able to come to Christ without admitting you have nothing to give and that Christ has everything. And there's the humility in that. And the second step are godly tears. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Or as one writer said, happy are the unhappy. Wow. That's hard, isn't it? And so against our culture, we just don't want to be unhappy. You know that song a while back, Don't Worry, Be Happy? That's what, where people are. I've noticed something over the last 30 to 40 years that funeral services have, people have begun to call them celebrations of life. And I believe that we should celebrate people's lives. But the difference between a Christian funeral service and a celebration of life is this is that many times in the celebration of life, God becomes that bicycle. God becomes an afterthought. And the service is totally focused on the person and their lives. And I read several accounts of why this is true. Well, we don't want to be sad. We want to be happy that we can celebrate this person's life. And there's something good about that, except that you will grieve You may deny it. You may say, I'm not going to worry. I'm going to be happy. I want to remember the good parts of the person's life. But if you lose someone, you're going to grieve. It may be a day later. It may be three years later, but you will. And there's a place for that in the Christian service. There's an acknowledgement that death is still an enemy, that it hurts, and that it's real. I remember talking to a woman one time a few years ago and I was doing the service for her husband and I happened to visit this man. They weren't members of my church, but I visited him. He knew he was dying. He was a real believer. We had a great conversation. We thought he would be around for several weeks, but the very next day he died. And I was doing the funeral service, and I remember talking to the lady, and I said, what we're doing here is a worship service, and it's primarily about God as we give thanks to him for your husband's life. I got a note from her after the service. She said two things to me. One, it was one of the best services she'd ever been to. I went, well, thank you. But she said, don't ever tell a grieving woman that a service is not about her husband. But it's not. It's about God. And in the context of worship, we thank God for lives. We're so full of ourselves and so narcissistic in our culture, so it's about us that we've forgotten that. And without God being the center, we can't grieve well. And what hope is there in just simply saying, don't worry, be happy? The Christian hope is that death is not the end of the story. And that's where joy can come. That's where real happiness can come. I'm just talking about a pet peeve I have. I admit it. But... I also think it's real that our culture is so deny and denial about pain and suffering, we forget it, we try to forget it. We need to remember that 
Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wept over your sins? Cried over them? You know, there is a sense in which we ought to mourn over the garbage that's in this place. We all have a sewer here. And there's a lot. I often ask that question if somebody is able to videotape your thoughts over the, even the last three months, would you want anyone to see them? Not me. I guarantee it. Steve Brown tells a story about a woman who came to him crying and she said, I just messed up. She had slept with her boyfriend. That doesn't happen often anymore that someone would weep over that. She wasn't weeping over the fact that she had had sex. She was weeping over the fact that she had done something she knew her Lord wouldn't want her to do. Steve looked at her and said, you know, you have a great opportunity here. Really, she said. You should go tell your boyfriend and tell him what you've done. Huh. And you know what? She did. She said, you know, what I did with you last night was in many ways wonderful, but it wasn't what the Lord wanted me to do, and I think it's hurt my relationship with him. And the boyfriend didn't know how to handle that. But you know, in the end, he started listening and came to the Lord himself. When we talk about this word called repentance, we, many of us conjures up images of breast beating and self-abuse, mistreatment of clothes, tearing the Pharisees, tearing their clothes, or a monastic life of self-denial and sackcloth and ashes. It's sort of like when we do something silly, especially in front of others, we want to go out and beat our head against the wall. But it's not like that. I'm going to admit something to you. I really like Harry Potter. And one of, the, um, one of the characters is an elf named Dobby. And what does Dobby do when he does something wrong? He goes, bad Dobby, bad Dobby, bad Dobby. I didn't hit myself too hard. That's not what we're talking about. Chuck Colson the person who founded the Prison Fellowship Ministry described an inmate who said that repentance is being so sorry it hurts. And I, I think we're missing that sometimes in our lives. We're missing the sorrow for sin in this world. We are not to be like the world, which does not admit its sins. We are to be first in admitting our sins and mourning over them. It's not a negative, it's honesty. It's not wallowing in self-pity, it's realizing we need help. And the comfort our God gives us in that help. Not sitting still, hurting it, but it's hurting enough over sins and the sins of others to do something. Repentance must begin with God's people as an example to the world. Let us join in mourning. Let us cry real tears and bitterness over bitterness and jealousy, over lust and cravings of the flesh, for our fear and refusal to stand up for what is right, for the lack of self-sacrifice and giving, and in crying let us be moved for God to help. Let us cry real tears over the sins of the world, over abused children, the divorce and breakup of families, the teenage pregnancies, and the murder of millions of children through abortion, the wasting of lives, thousands of lives through alcohol and drugs, and on and on it goes. There's a lot to cry about. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to get mad about. We're not called to just sit. So sorry, it hurts. Finally, there's, uh, and we'll continue next week, this word called meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. It's a strange thing, isn't it? 
Again, I think we have it wrong. I think we tend to think about meekness as being passive and cowardly. I read many years ago, and I've actually looked it up online to see if it's still there, and it's not, but I read about a man uh, named Dixon who wrote a book called Cower Power. To get into the spirit of things, he founded a group of, for submissive people that was called Doormats. It stood for dependent organization of really meek and timid souls, if there's no objection. Their motto was, the meek shall inherit the earth if that's okay with everybody. Their symbol was a yellow traffic light. Jesus is not talking about that. Jesus do doesn't say we can't stand up for ourselves, that we can't have courage, that we can't have aggression at times, that we can't go out into the world and do things. What he's saying is that is what we've been hearing many people say these days, that it's not about you. You know, I need to, I, I say all the time, and I'm sure you've heard it many times, and if you, I'm here long enough, you'll hear me say it that we will never forgive anyone more than God has forgiven us. We will never forgive anyone more than God has forgiven us. What we're talking about is humility. We realize we have nothing to bring to God at all, but in his mercy, God gives us everything. And in that humility, we, because we've been forgiven, because we've been given mercy, we can give mercy to others. Because God forgives us. There's an old saying among people, and I think it's a good one for all of us, that I am the biggest sinner I know. And I can say that truthfully because I know Chris really well. I don't know everything about you, and I'm not sure we're called to. Pastors know a lot about people in churches. But I'm still the biggest sinner I know. And I don't beat myself up over that. But what it does is remind me that because God in his mercy has made me his, I need to be merciful as well. And that's what we're called to do. And that leads, surprisingly, to a settled peace and a settled happiness, a joy that we can have because we've been forgiven. What a great thing that is. We've been forgiven and that should fill us with joy and then we are able to give mercy to others which also should fill us with joy. Let us remember that, especially today as we take the communion service because this all this this wonderful meal that we had a simple meal reminds us of a simple truth Jesus died for you and for me and because of what Jesus has done we are free and clear and we belong to our Lord that's the good news so come today and if by chance you've never come to Jesus as your Savior, just realize he's not out to get you. He's out to forgive you, but you have to go and ask. And that takes humility. But why not? And then come and eat and drink. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we uh, thank you for Jesus' words. They're a lot deeper than we thought. Just a phrase or two can mean so much. And so often they are just the opposite of what we might think or certainly what the world thinks. We ask you would help us to take these words and make them so much a part of our lives. These familiar words, these things we've heard many times, may they become new and real to us. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior. And it is in his name we pray.